the World Economic Forum. I'll be your moderator for today's session. Uh, and just to let you know, this uh, session will be recorded and it will be published on our YouTube channel. Please feel free to ask questions in the Zoom chat. Uh, some of them will be answered in the chat. Some of the questions will be um, fed up to me and, and then to the speakers. So throughout the session, we'll have opportunities to, to answer some of those questions. Uh, today, um, I'm supported by a few people from the, the GMF team. So you may be getting some responses in the, uh, in the chat from them. Um, and just to, to give you an idea of the structure of today's session, I will be providing an overview of the pilot mapping study uh, of, of zero emission projects to begin with. Uh, and then we will launch into deep dives into several case studies on zero emission pilot projects. And we'll save the bulk of the time for that because I, I think that's really the most interesting uh, the interest, most interesting aspect of, of this webinar. And for the case studies, I've invited some guest speakers along. Uh, and it, it's a good mix of people from across the value chain and the world, in fact. Uh, we have Captain Peter Liu from Eagle Star Marine Holdings. Uh, we also have uh, Jacob Stephenson from, from DFDS introducing the Green Fields for Denmark project. And then we have uh, Harry Datachea and Cami Lowe from VOPAC talking about bunkering of zero emission fuels, specifically ammonia. So let's get underway then with the overview of the findings of the pilot mapping study. So the mapping of zero emission pilots and demonstration projects uh, study includes projects focusing on zero emission pathways for the maritime industry. And the study uh, covers a range of projects focused on ship technology, fuel production, as well as bunkering. Um, and the, the information in the mapping study is based on publicly available information. Uh, it's, it's important to note. Uh, so a lot of these projects have been found uh, through desktop research or by the, the, the generosity of uh, various stakeholders and members of the Getting to Zero Coalition who have submitted these projects to us uh, and, and helped us with this research. So although the, uh, the, the study we have is certainly a representative data set of what is happening in zero emission uh, projects around the world, it is by no means exhaustive. Uh, and we certainly hope to, uh, hope to improve this data set uh, through sort of sharing this study uh, with, with uh, people um, through webinars like this and, and through other mediums. So uh, important to note that this study was released at the end of March uh, and it was the third edition of the pilot mapping study. Uh, and the, the second edition had been released a year earlier. That second edition had 106 projects uh, and this edition now has 203 projects. So you can see that there is, there is quite a lot of work happening uh, in the sector uh, and a lot more, more coming into the spotlight. I'm gonna show you a few of the, the key charts from the study that summarize the findings. Uh, and there's certainly an opportunity to, um, to ask some questions. Um, and, and there's a lot more detail in the report itself, of course. Okay. Um, just wait till I share my screen. Um, and I believe you can see that. So, uh, can you, yes, I think that's, that's working there. Um, so, what we see here is an overview of the projects in the pilot mapping study. Uh, as I mentioned, the ship technology, fuel production and bunkering and infrastructure projects. Uh, what this chart shows is that roughly two thirds of the projects included in the mapping study focus on ship technology. Uh, and they're, they're really occurring across a diverse range of fuels and vessel types. Uh, we can also see that there's been a really strong ramp up over the last few years 
in zero emission projects of all types uh, across that ship technology, fuel production and bunkering. Uh, this chart here shows uh, some of the different fuel types and the vessel types uh, that, that zero emission projects are occurring on. Um, hold on uh, what, we, what we can see here is that uh, when it comes to ferries, there are clear preferences emerging uh, for battery power and hydrogen. Uh, with, other, with, with other vessel types, such as tankers, uh, we have a clear preference for ammonia and methanol. And across the other types of vessels, there's a variety of technologies being used. Something that's really useful is breaking these uh, more granular vessel types down into small and large vessel projects. Uh, and, and then charting that against what fuel types are used. What we can see, um, if we look at the, the green bars, which are large vessels, and the blue bars, which are small vessels, is that there's clear preferences emerging uh, for uh, vessel types using different fuels, uh, depending on what size they are. So we can see that with uh, large vessels, ammonia is the clear leader, with many more projects happening uh, for, for um, with, with ammonia on, on large vessels, and it's used a little bit uh, with small vessels. When it comes to small vessels, uh, we have a real preference for battery power uh, and, and not so much on, on large vessels. Uh, other fuel types like hydrogen and methanol uh, are both uh, extremely popular across large and small vessels. And something important to note about hydrogen uh, here for small vessels is about 60% of these small vessel projects that involve hydrogen are actually hydrogen fuel cell projects. So that means that, uh, that that's another way of uh, electrifying these vessels in addition to, to battery power, uh, with the remaining 40% of those projects being uh, hydrogen internal combustion engine projects. We've also seen uh, a, a large sort of growth in, in methanol projects, particularly on large ships just in the last few years, which is also an interesting trend coming through. Uh, turning now to fuel production trends, uh, we can see that there's been rapid growth uh, in, in fuel production projects over the, the last few years, uh, and particularly in hydrogen, but with ammonia also emerging uh, quite strongly uh, in, in 2021. Uh, about 79% of all fuel production projects are green hydrogen or green ammonia. Uh, moving then to bunkering and infrastructure project trends, we can see that it largely follows the same, uh, the same trends we're seeing in fuel production, with hydrogen and ammonia uh, really increasing in, in how many uh, pilot projects are, are being launched. But we also have a lot of uh, battery power um, infrastructure and, and recharging projects coming online uh, as well. Another interesting element of the study, uh, and it's the first time that we've tracked this, is what parts of the value chain are involved in each project. As you can see, uh, there's sort of shipbuilder equipment technology uh, stakeholders are involved in the most in energy production, along with ship owners and, and ship operators. But something that was really interesting uh, in this study is that we noticed that uh, the demand side, so freight forwarders, customer, cargo owners and charterers was quite low. About 10% of projects uh, had one of these stakeholders involved, um, which is interesting because uh, obviously the demand side will be a crucial element uh, to getting zero emission pilot projects into those, those further developed stages. So that highlights a potential gap uh, in, in zero emissions projects that's occurring at the moment. Turning to where the projects are taking place, uh, we, oh, sorry, I've ducked out of my presentation. 
uh, let me just get back to the slide. Um, we can see that Europe and, and Asia really dominate uh, the, the projects that are taking place. And interestingly, Asia doubled its number of projects from about 31 to, to 61 uh, over the last year. Other interesting trends that are emerging is that we see in Oceania, particularly Australia, where I'm based, there's a lot of fuel production projects starting to occur, denoted by the, the blue columns. And finally, I wanted to, to share sort of an insight about public funding uh, by fuel focus. So we're seeing a lot of we're seeing a lot of public funding coming through. And when we measure public funding uh, against these projects, we're only talking about direct public funding. So there are a lot of other forms of government support uh, that have been used, such as, as subsidies and, and direct government involvement. But this just tracks direct award of, of funding. What we can see though, interestingly, is hydrogen uh, projects are more often funded than they're not funded. Uh, and same with battery power. On the hydrogen side, uh, this makes total sense in terms of uh, a lot of the uh, strategic priorities that nations are setting around developing hydrogen economies. So it'll be an interesting trend to, to watch um, over the next year or so. Uh, moving, moving back to just, just some sort of general comments uh, on those insights there. Uh, you know, the, the individual detail of all these projects is included on the next gen shipping website, which is a joint project between the, the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore and the International Maritime Organization. So if you want to dig into what exact projects are there, that's a great resource. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, we're always keen to improve the quality of the data set. So as new projects come to light, please, uh, we, we'd really appreciate uh, a heads up on, on new projects um, from, from stakeholders in the shipping industry. It helps us gather a much better data set uh, and, uh, and sort of provide better insights to you. So I'll leave it there uh, in terms of the overview of the, of the research, um, because I think we, we want to start hearing from some of our our guest speakers. So our first guest speaker will be uh, Jacob Stephenson. Uh, he's a shipping and innovation um, and sector integration expert based in Denmark. Uh, Mr. Stephenson is currently the director and innovation lead of sustainable fleet projects at DFDS. And he's also a master mariner and chairman of the innovation committee for Danish shipping, as well as chairman of Green Ship of the Future, an organization which develops environmental and energy efficiency projects in the shipping and maritime industry. So I'll leave it to Jacob to uh, take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. And thank you for, uh, for having me here. I'll just try to, uh, to share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, right. that's right. Okay, okay. Um, DFDS is this uh, integrated shipping and logistic company. We are only up here in Europe. We, we don't do uh, do global shipping. We have approximately uh, 70 big ships, row row ships and passenger ships, and we are about uh, 11,000 uh, employees. DFDS, we have built our last uh, uh, black ships um, all is going to be uh, green going forward, but it makes no sense to build uh, sustainable ships if you don't have the fuel available. So DFDS are involved in a couple of uh, actually quite large uh, alternative fuel projects, of which I will be uh, giving you a, a quick update on the Green Fuels for Denmark project today. The Green Fuels for Denmark uh, project is about a... Um, of course, making the, the, the zero emission fuels available, but it's also about how, how do we get the cost down? And we are chasing large scale in order to, uh, to get the cost uh, down. And we are achieving a, a, a large scale by bundling the energy demand from Uh, from aviation and, and road transport and, uh, and shipping um, uh, in, in order to be able to go for the scale we need in, in order to, to get the cost down. Um, 
Greenfields for Denmark uh, builds upon the insights learned in the H2REST uh, uh, project, which I have here described as, a, as, as a phase zero uh, of the project. That project, uh, there the, uh, the, the team um, learns about how can we couple uh, offshore wind with, the, with electrolysis. Initially, the, the Green Fuels for Denmark project was split into three phases, where the first uh, one was to go live in, in 23, uh, the phase two was to go live in, uh, in 27, and, and then the, the fully implemented large-scale project was uh, intended to be implemented in, in 2030. But we have actually decided to, to speed up the, the, the implementation. So instead of, uh, of uh, just having a phase two that went live in, in 27, we have decided to, uh, to actually implement the first 100 megawatts uh, already in, uh, in, in 25. Um, but the first thing that that will be available is uh, is that we will get we'll get uh, uh, here already next year there will be a 10 megawatt of uh, electrolysis uh, available which we can use for uh, uh, for, uh, for for smaller projects uh, it could be used for roadside logistics and also potentially uh, maybe projects like a, like a, um, uh, shore power based on uh, on, uh, on on PIM, uh, fuel cells Phase two uh, A is, um, is is the is the fast forward uh, where we try to uh, we we uh, here in the Greater Copenhagen area we have a big uh, straw fired uh, boiler where we will be able to to capture um, uh, biogenic uh, quite quite nice amounts of biogenic uh, CO two and that we are going to to combine with the with the hundred megawatt of electrolysis and then get started with the with the, um, uh, building a uh, methanol production. And right now we're in this process of, uh, of uh, getting permission to, uh, to build the factory um, and, and all is, is, uh, is actually on, on track. Then, uh, and, and the energy has also been sourced uh, for, um, it, 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 the energy has actually been sourced, I, I believe for the 250 megawatt um, uh, also. So, so we, have, we, we are quite good on, uh, on track. In order really to scale the project, we need to put up a lot of, uh, of additional renewable uh, electricity, electricity uh, offshore wind, um, and that uh, we are also looking into. For DFDS, uh, it has been a, a, a very nice eye opener. We have learned a lot uh, in in this project, and because we feel comfortable that uh, that uh, large scale production of hydrogen will be available here in Copenhagen, right next, uh, almost very close to uh, to uh, to one of our big uh, passenger ships. We have actually uh, also materialized, uh, a, 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 or not materialized, but, but together with project partners, we have looked into, would it actually be possible to build a big um, passenger ship that, uh, that utilizes the, uh, the local production of uh, hydrogen? And um, it is expensive to build, so uh, we have uh, applied for funding in order to see if we can, uh, if it's possible to materialize. Um, and we, uh, the project partners, we, we have filed the, the application, the and, uh, EU reverted, they, when, when you ask EU for money, they can say, oh, great project here, you have all the money you need. They can also say, oh no, that is a stupid project, forget all about that. We landed in this middle section where they said that uh, we actually really like the project, but you guys are not really good at writing EU applications. So right now we are in this process where we have been hooked up uh, together with the European Investment Bank, uh, where they are smart smartening us up a little bit uh, uh, um, so that we can uh, uh, improve the application. And then later on, we will need to make a decision if we are going to, uh, to reapply for, uh, for, uh, for funding for, uh, for such a ship. But that was what I had uh, prepared for the, for, uh, for the update. Thank you, Jacob. That was a, a really good uh, introduction to a project that uh, sort of it ticks many of the, the boxes that we went through in terms of public funding and uh, and, and creating uh, sort of coalitions around demand and, and an integrated approach with, with many uh, parts of the value chain. And, and something I, I'd be interested if, if you have uh, some thoughts is 
you know, how important is it to this project that it has uh, a broad set of stakeholders? And, and do you think that's the model that, uh, that, that works best for these types it, of pilot it, projects? It really, it really adds a lot of value to, uh, to, to, to have the broad perspective. Before DFDS got involved in this project, we never spoke to, uh, for instance, to the aviation guys. Uh, why should a shipping company talk to, uh, to aviation? But by having the dialogues and understanding their decarbonization pathway, uh, we actually uh, uh, learn quite a lot regarding how 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 could uh, how could we run uh, our our pathways in parallel and that not not collide and and uh, create uh, yeah. issues uh, for each other. How do we do it smart and uh, and and cost efficient? Um, yeah, it, it it really adds value to 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 look broad. Yeah, and and I assume that there's probably some benefits in those learnings from from other sectors, uh, for, for broader than just the project. Then, yeah, it, it, I'm I'm a little concerned about uh, actually having talked so much much about the hydrogen ship, but because maybe it's actually a, a, almost like a red herring, because for the majority of our ships, hydrogen uh, it would be a cool fuel, uh, but but we will not be able to have enough energy on board. So most likely we will need to go large scale with the uh, with ammonia or or, or, or or methanol, and this dialogue with the aviation industry that is where we uh, have uh, understand we might need to bet a large scale on uh, on on green ammonia. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And I know there's uh, there are some questions uh, coming up in the chat, and we'll, um, we'll we'll certainly get to some of those later in the uh, later in the piece. But Jacob, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so next, I would like to welcome uh, our two speakers from uh, Vopac. So first of all, uh, Harry Dutatreya is Global Energy Director at Royal Vopac. He has over 30 years experience in the tank storage industry um, and held managerial positions in Europe, Asia, Mexico, um, and is, uh, is uh, currently leading global energy developments uh, for Royal Vopac. Uh, Harry has been working for Vopac with international and national oil companies, trading houses as well. And he has also served on many joint venture boards and is involved in the strategic positioning of Vopac's uh, global tank storage network. Harry, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rob. Uh, thanks for inviting uh, us to this uh, session. I think from our side, uh, well, uh, my role is really in global energy, and I think that underlines the fact that we really look at end markets. So in the past, it was really like oil, chemicals, gases. And what you see now is that end markets, uh, they have a demand and are shifting across the full product range. So if you talk about shipping, and that's a nice one, uh, you showed it with uh, the containers. Uh, you can see there uh, both methanol, bio products, hydrogen, LNG, as well as the, the original products. So that, that boundary is shifting. So we are also more looking at end markets. But for the session for today, uh, I'm gonna to say a few words about VOPAC and then Kemi Lowe will really talk about, uh, she's our commercial manager in Singapore. We'll talk about uh, practical experiences in Singapore with ammonia. So that's a bit uh, how the setup is. Um, let me see and share my screen. I do hope it works. Yeah. I think that is uh, correct. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Now, as you can see, uh, just to start with Volpac, we are an independent tank storage company. And that basically means that um, yeah, we are not having any commercial interest in the project products that we handle. So um, we are not trading in products. We are just offering the service in the ports around the globe. Um, and obviously, uh, yeah, the products that are being handled in terminals around the globe are changing. So we do have, we are preparing for a lower carbon future, which means that we have a, a new energy group that is looking at the whole range. Yeah? So we're looking at decarbonization of industrial clusters. We are looking at products like bio, uh, now bio to a lesser extent, but really in, in hydrogen-based products, ammonia, you can think about flow batteries, uh, plastic recycling, all these low carbon technologies are, development, are developing. Now, uh, that's an area where we're looking at. If you look at our terminal network, um, 
we have around 70 terminals around the globe and we handle the full range of products. So that means uh, both gases, and I will talk about that a bit later, but also liquids, including uh, the traditional fossil products like uh, oil, the whole range of chemicals from, from methanol, uh, which is a bulk chemical to uh, specialty chemicals. Um, and we are also in quite a few industrial clusters active and fully integrated with some of the industries. So if you talk about producing low carbon fuels, that is really an area where we're uh, interacting with. Uh, yeah, with regard to, to marine activities, I think that, uh, yeah, just to mention here, we are, we have a presence in five out of the 10 top uh, bunker locations. And I think what I would like to stress is that if you look at marine transport, it is really a few vessel classes that consume the maximum amount of fuels. So if you look at container vessels, uh, tankers and bulk carriers, then you have a very large segment of the total consumption. And uh, if you look at locations that are suitable for uh, bunkering, then it's really very often centered along, around those trade lanes. And that really drives uh, the bunkering uh, industry. So for us, we have the five locations. You can see it in the map. So it really uh, is in LA, Panama in the Americas, and then we have uh, the ARA, Rotterdam, Fujaira in the Emirates, as well as Singapore, the massive Singaporean bunker market. Talking about uh, ammonia, now, we already handle ammonia in six locations. Uh, if you look at the map, you can see that uh, uh, as the red dot, um, about 250,000 cubic meters. And we have recently announced to develop a new ammonia terminal in Rotterdam, together with uh, Gazuni as well as S. So it's really, uh, yeah, ammonia is a product and Kami will go deeper into it, which is really not, not as simple as, uh, let's say, the regular fuels. It's a very complex and potentially dangerous fuel. So it needs to be handled properly. Now, ammonia being a gas uh, has some overlap with uh, other gases. And we added to the map some of the key locations where we handle the LNG, but also uh, LPG and butane, uh, butadiene and other chemical gases. So it's really a, a global uh, footprint. Um, yeah, before going forward, I would like to mention one point, and that is that if you look at uh, changing uh, bunker fuels, then you're really talking about uh, yeah, a very extensive industry uh, that uh, is continuing to change. Huh? It used to be a, a single fuel product, uh, high silver fuel oil, mainly. And what you see is that uh, when we moved to uh, the IMO 2020 spec and the loads over spec, there was a lot of debate about the availability of product. But at the end of the day, I think the industry showed that it was very resilient. It went pretty much uh, fairly smoothly. And I think that uh, yeah, the challenge that we see ahead will have similar elements. And obviously some products are easy to shift to. If you talk about blending bio into uh, bunkers, that's already happening right now. Methanol is also relatively simple, but if you move to uh, even LNG, but especially ammonia, a lot of new elements will come up. Now that's a bit on the, the general part. Uh, let's move over to uh, Kemi. Kemi, over to you. Uh. Excellent. I'll, um, I'll just introduce Kemi to everyone, a, a bit more about Kemi. So Kemi Lo is the commercial manager of chemicals and gas at Bokpak Terminal Singapore and is responsible for commercial activities of approximately 1 million cubic metres of chemicals and gas tankage capacity in Bopak, Singapore, across three locations, Banyan, Panjuru, and Sakra terminals. She has over eight years experience in the tank storage industry. And before joining Bopak in 2014, Kami was previously a marine fuel trader with Peninsula Petroleum. Uh, Kami, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Hari. So um, good afternoon on my end here in Singapore to the participants uh, today. So Kami Lo here, Commercial Manager for um, Chemicals and Gas for Park Singapore. I'm happy to be sharing a little bit more on the specifics of our experience from Singapore handling ammonia. Um, we are the only storage provider currently in Singapore uh, for a 10,000 cube ammonia tank on Jurong Island at our Banyan terminal. Um, before, let me just um, prepare the slides um, and pull it out for sharing. If you can see it. And I'll put it on a slideshow. 
Okay, so here we are. Um, as I was mentioning, this is uh, what you see right here is actually the uh, actual photos of the ammonia tank we have in Singapore currently. We also later successfully commissioned an ammonia truck bay um, at the same location in 2020, whereby henceforth we are then the only um, shipping and truck loading ammonia provider in this region uh, for that allows independent access to our customers. So as um, the only provider that was permitted by the authorities to store and um, handle ammonia, uh, we are also honored to be part of a six-party consortium formed last year together with Itochu, um, Pavilion Energy, Hotel, and MOL, with the support of uh, Singapore Maritime Port Authority to develop an ammonia fuel supply chain and to study the development or support the study of development for ammonia supply vessels. Um, at the same time, we are also a study partner um, commissioned um, by the Global Centre for Maritime Decarbonisation set up by Singapore MPA again um, to study um, ammonia bunkering safety and to path the way for its future deployment when available on scale. So on the left here, you will see the illustration of the actual tank and the related assets in the terminal. This, will, this setup will be pretty similar to how uh, ammonia will be deployed as a zero carbon bunker fuel when the technology matures eventually. Uh, as of uh, public literature right now, the, the, the industry is hoping to, to welcome the first uh, engine hopefully by 2024 to 2025. I would like to also qualify that at this stage, we have yet to ascertain if the supply of ammonia as a bunker fuel will be in a refrigerated form that will be coming in at negative 33, 35 degrees Celsius or pressurized at seven bar. So that is, um, that is still KIV in that sense. Um, so the potential of ammonia as a zero carbon fuel has already attracted much attention. And that is really because of the following points. Um, it's already available in about um, commodity shipping and traded way, been stored and transferred globally. It has been uh, already been used in a, in a large scale way for, in many credible applications in the pet can sector, as well as in power generation and potentially hydrogen carrier. Currently, it is the highest, um, it has the highest volumetric energy density of any zero carbon fuels. Um, and that is at, uh, for, for a magnitude purpose at double the energy of liquid hydrogen. At the same time, um, we are able to use existing LPG and LNG infrastructure in storage and transport with certain modifications naturally to handle ammonia uh, when, uh, when required. So having said the above, it would have been a very suitable and uh, attractive solution for our maritime industry if it wasn't for its toxicity that requires a stringent safety standards, measures and training for personnel um, handling the, its operations. So we are talking about um, in, in, in the technicalities of um, storage terminaling, terminaling, a double containment was, Insulated, um, insulated infrastructure, gas detection all around its uh, facilities, bun walls that are raised higher and water screens, etc. There is currently a lack of um, global harmonized standards um, set by authorities for its tanks des design and operational procedures, as well as to consider that a large risk contour um, of safety distance needs to be maintained, henceforth requiring a large land area for its setup at the same time, when we talk about serving the demand centers, we are probably likely to be close to populated areas. Therefore, um, obtaining, uh, obtaining the safety permits and storage permits to handle ammonia is already challenging even from Singapore. And that is why we only currently have one ammonia tank right here. So I, I think uh, the crew mindset, the training, and as a responsible provider, having a redundancy plan for managing its operation is also a must. Um, this brings me to the, the point here that um, as uh, stress and hopefully emphasize the readiness of our ammonia storage infrastructure for bunkering uh, will need to grow in a large scale to be ready when the technology for uh, deployment of it as a marine fuel is, uh, is uh, deployed or matures. We see an evenly spread out um, cluster of low or zero carbon demand centers uh, for bunkers but they are probably likely to be served by supply locations that are not exactly along conventional trade routes. That is talking about Australia, Northern China, uh, Morocco, maybe Chile and uh, Canada. So this will require us um, to really think in advance and, and uh, be, be quite early prepared 
uh, for, for the growth of this industry uh, that is currently not inadequate to serve uh, the maritime sector. So why we say this is because we need to know that uh, ammonia has a lower energy density compared to fuel oil at um, 3.5 times. So that, that's to say that to offer the same amount of energy to transport the goods, uh, we will need 3.5 uh, times the amount of ammonia as compared to fuel oil. If we look at Singapore as the world top uh, bunkering location in the world, uh, they served 50 million tons of fuel oil last year. So just serving or, or capturing 1% of Singapore's market to, um, to, be, to be met by ammonia will imply that 2 million cubic meters of ammonia in Singapore will be required per year. And that actually translates in our uh, terminology as around 250,000 cubic meters of ammonia storage. So um, currently, just uh, looking at the existing applications of ammonia, we are seeing a seaboard, seaboard trade of 18 million metric tons uh, being transported via the sea. And when ammonia is going to be used as a bunker fuel, we foresee that the demand um, of ammonia will outstrip its supply output currently by at least two times. This, uh, this is possible to be met as mentioned by the new uh, green ammonia locations that are likely to come out but it will also imply huge demand for um, shipping and storage uh, infrastructure uh, that will need uh, early planning. And we're talking about a timeline of at least two years to construct a new built facility together with probably the likely conversion of existing gas infrastructure as earlier mentioned like LPG and LNG. So Vopak is uh, hands closely watching the development of this um, uh, technologies and studies and we are very open to participate in visibility studies at this moment. Uh, being in close dialogue and contact with the suppliers and shippers uh, to be ready to put in the investments at these key demand centers, such as Singapore is where I'm sitting, um, even before um, the, the engine has been put in place. So Rob, um, with this, I, I can conclude here and I hand it over to you. Thank you, Kami, for that, that uh, uh, presentation and, and lots of details around what's happening in the, the ammonia space. Uh, something I, I was quite interested in, um, in in that presentation was just the, the scale of infrastructure investment required, but then this uh, perhaps opportunity to use some of the existing LNG uh, and LPG infrastructure. Uh, can you talk a little bit more perhaps about uh, what the, the types of modifications are uh, and what the, the scale is and, and you know, will, will that be able to support this uh, sort of rapid development of ammonia? Right. Um, so it will be an economic study actually when the investor decides to build new build or convert an existing facility. We must bear in mind that ammonia has a higher uh, density than LPG or LNG and it's also stored at a higher temperature even though it's negative 33 but that's vis-a-vis -vis, uh, LPG at negative 47 and LNG at negative 152. So um, there will be parts that will need to be replaced. For example, significantly the boil off gas compressor, the recovery of the gas, because um, um, we have a boil off gas concerns for LNG that are different from ammonia. And in the industry it's widely wide, wide known that for LNG, the boil off gas losses can be quite significant. It is less so for ammonia, but that does not mean that the same equipment can be used to handle uh, these two products of varying density, for example. So uh, significantly, I would think the pumps need to be changed, the type of pumps, the type of oil gas compressors, uh, the wall of the tanks need to be uh, calculated and assessed whether it can handle a heavier product. Then uh, that comes at a higher pressure probably than the um, LNG and LPG. So it will be it might be cheaper than a new build. So I, again, we come back to the economic study required for the investor to yep. consider. Yeah, it, it, it's really interesting because obviously it's a conversation that's happening in, in shipping technology as well around retrofitting certain vessels. So there's, a, I guess, a lot of information to come through here. And Harry, a, a question for you before we move on is um, from your global perspective, what sort of support um, is required from uh, port authorities and, and governments to sort of accelerate some of these projects? Yeah, I think that, uh, well, in, in general, uh, if you want to promote uh, or, or boost uh, zero carbon shipping, it's good to have uh, uh, some, some, some policy measures in that field. 
Uh, if you go, uh, I think a lot of debate on, is already on that and really to have consistency there. But I do think that uh, if you talk about more practical ammonia bunkering, I mean, like what Kemi said, eh? I mean, it's, it's not like handling uh, a nice uh, liquid. It's really a dangerous product. So I do think that it makes a lot of sense to identify specific trade lanes and uh, to do some uh, pilots there. And, and especially what's important is to have some global standards for this uh, ammonia bunkering. So if you do ammonia bunkering, what is the standard and, and have consistency there? Because at the end of the day, uh, the biggest consumers of uh, low carbon fuels, eh, these are the big ships, they move around the globe. So they need to be able to bunker in uh, different locations. So I would say standards at this moment, um, I, I think it's also important to um, take the time to really develop that. You have some pilots there and have some global cooperation. So I could imagine that uh, if you take um, a number of ports around the globe uh, for specific trade lanes, that could be a good starting point. So it could be Singapore, obviously, with maybe part of it in Rotterdam or in another port, but really try to set it up in that way. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kami and, and Harry. Um, we'll come back to you at the end, but uh, for now, I would like to introduce uh, Captain Peter Liu, who is, is Managing Director and CEO of Eagle Star Marine Holdings, uh, part of the MISC Burhad Group. Captain Peter joined MISC in 1984 and sailed on various types of tankers for, for 10 years, finishing his sea career as Master Mariner. Since then, Captain Peter has held numerous senior management roles in global shipping across Asia and the Americas. Uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome Captain Peter to talk about the, the Castor initiative and particularly the development of ammonia powered VLCCs. Thank you, Rob, for having me. Um, again, Rob, I uh, apologize for the delay just now and uh, to the panel members as well. Sorry for delay. I know there's some some last minute reshuffling or resh uh, rescheduling that needs to be done. And Jacob, thank you very much for taking up the first one uh, over to me. Um, let me try to share my, my presentations. Um, um, and again, um, I'm here talking about uh, the the uh, the Kester initiative in particular, especially on the uh, Dofield ammonia uh, vessels projects that we are currently embarking on. Uh, but I think it will be it, it will not do justice to the Kester initiative if I don't introduce Kester initiative here. So please do allow me a little bit of a couple of minutes just to introduce Kester initiative. Okay. Kesna initiative actually started as a uh, joint development projects by three parties, namely Samsung Heavy Industry, the, the shipyard the builder, uh, MIC, where I came from, and of course, Lloyd registered. Uh, the intention then actually was to uh, create a platform for the like-minded uh, industry players to come together to look into the possibility of developing and building a zero emission vessels um, at that time. Um, it, was, it was then in 2019. And in 2021, um, we were joined by Man, uh, the engine makers, Yara, the, uh, the producers of ammonia, MPA, Singapore. And uh, subsequently in November 2021, Jurong Port also joined us into the Casta uh, Initiative. Um, Casta Initiative, uh, uh, currently now has seven partners. Um, uh, the uh, the initiative is still to try to develop the uh, the first um, zero emission vessels, predominantly focusing on ammonia as the uh, as a few solutions. Um, if I can go to the next slide. Okay, um, jumping straight into the projects that I'm talking about. Um, really, the since 2019, on the formations of Castor Initiative or the Joint Development Project, then uh, there was there have been a lot of uh, uh, workshop uh, subcommittees being set up by the initiative and so on and so forth to talk into the possibility of developing. And uh, in 2022, we believe that the time had come for us to put the concept into realizations, at least the initial part of it. With that. Um, uh, Samsung Heavy Industry, MISC, uh, through its subsidiary 
uh, AET and Lloyd registered signed on a MOU to build a dual fuel ammonia uh, carrier. Um, on that, AET then went into a LOI uh, letter intense agreement with SHI, a conditional LOI to actually build a VLCC dual fuel uh, ammonia dual fuel vessels. And um, the other partners in the Castor Initiative, namely MANS, Yara, MP, and Jurong Ports, committed to support those MOU as well as those LOI. Um, the, deliver, the delivery of the particular projects uh, is basically a two VLCC uh, dual fuel, ammonia dual fuel vessels. Uh, and the target uh, currently being set is somewhere around between 2005 and 2006, though we gave ourselves until 2030 as, the, uh, as a more realistic timeline, given the fact that there's still a lot of challenges that we have to overcome. Now, going straight to the key challenges that the projects are currently facing. Um, I think for the most part, I must say that uh, Kemi have covered it, uh, but just to, just to just to highlight it again, the propulsion is one of the challenges that we are facing. As we are talking, the engine is currently being developed, uh, as the panel members have mentioned just now. They expected the first engine somewhere around between 2004 and uh, maybe perhaps even as early as late 2003. But that is still very subjective, depending on the test that is currently going on uh, by MAND. Uh, we also understand that other engine makers uh, are also in the process of developing the engines, um, depending on who you are talking to. Uh, that is one part of the challenges that we are facing. Uh, of course, uh, Kemi had mentioned just now about regulations. Um, and here, being a ship owners, we are focusing more on the constructions and the operations uh, regulations. Uh, yes, currently now there's no standard regulations. And um, as we are building the vessels, as we intend to build the vessels, the, the parties come together and look into developing also the standards, the rules, and the regulations with regards to the construction, the operation, and also the bunkering of the uh, ammonia bunkering. And then the third one is, of course, the, uh, the fuel itself. Um, here, we are talking about the capability of uh, volume uh, and um, as well as the facilities. I think for the most part, uh, you have heard uh, Kami and Harry talking about the, the challenges of having the logistics built and so on and so forth. And taking the cue from the LNG uh, dual fuel vessels, uh, even until today, uh, if you ask me whether is there sufficient facilities to bunker LNG vessels, the answer is perhaps yes, but for the most part, we are still hoping that more facilities will be available. And if you look at ammonia starting from scratch, this is where we are hoping that people like Jerome Port, uh, War Park, and the rest of the uh, industry players will support the initiative um, uh, going forward in terms of supply and facilities. And uh, again, when you talk about, I think Rob, you mentioned just now about the lack of uh, interest or the lack of participations from the end users, uh, the, uh, the, the charters uh, and the consumer, um, as well as from the financial, the fund managers, the, the banks and so on and so forth. This has continuously to be a challenge. We are hoping that uh, we will be able to attract more interest uh, from these two segments, two sectors to complete the whole entire cycles of, uh, of uh, of, uh, of the value chain uh, with regards to building and uh, constructing a, a effective and a, a practical uh, ammonia carriers, if you will. And last but not least, I think this was also uh, captured by Kemi just now with regards to capability building, knowledge and uh, abilities. Again, this is a new technology, nobody has the expertise. But that being said, ammonia not as a fuel, but as a cargo have been carried around for years. Um, and we know that there's the shipment, there's also to a certain extent transshipments of, of ammonia in the world. So ammonia as a cargo is not new. Ammonia as a cargo being shipped across the ocean is not new, but ammonia as a bunker is new. So we still need to develop those capabilities and those abilities in order to uh, operate uh, ammonia uh, fuel vessels. Uh, with that, uh, Rob, I end my uh, 
my presentations. I'm keeping the 10 minutes that you're given to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Captain Peter. And we, um, we, we do have a question for you that's come through on the, the, the chat, uh, which is, how important do you think uh, the dual fuel capabilities will be to deployment of ammonia vessels? And so if markets require these vessels to sometimes switch between ammonia and conventional fuel, do you know uh, if operations on conventional fuel will be efficient or competitive? Uh, I mean, any, any, any insights you could offer on the um, dual fuels as a, as a development opportunity would be greatly appreciated. I mean, if you give the industry the opportunities, obviously, uh, conventional fuel, um, uh, due to its horrific value, due to its pricing and all this thing, is more competitive compared to uh, ammonia fuel. Uh, the same thing because uh, we can say about uh, LNG, though LNG as a fuel have a higher horrific value as compared to a conventional fuel today, be it the gas oil or be it uh, the fuel oil, uh, low sulfur fuel oil. But that being said, uh, that is what we have been advocating in the industry for a long time, to level the playing field in order to encourage the, the, the industry okay, to move towards a low carbon fuel. There must be a, 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 a level field, otherwise um, shipping as a business, we'll continue to look for the cheapest means of propulsion, the cheapest mean of fuel. Okay, so that that level of playing field can come in the form of incentive or can come in the form of tax. Um, depends. But currently now, this is where, in my opinion, the the disconnections. Whereas uh, the industry realized that we need to move towards a more lower carbon emissions or maybe even a net zero carbon emissions, but they need to have a level playing field. And, and Captain Peter, to, to begin with, um, I guess, do you think that the, the sort of dual fuel capabilities of a vessel being able to, I guess, run on those more price competitive conventional fuels and then switch to ammonia, do, do you see that as key to the development of, of ammonia vessels as, as a, um, by themselves? Is that a stepping stone? Um, I think if you... If you ask me, Rob, whether can we build a, a one single fuel ammonia ammonia fuel uh, vessels? I think the answer at the moment now, yes, it will be possible, but is it really practical? I think the answer is no, yeah. because of the lack of abilities uh, to uh, the supply chain in terms of ammonia and so on and so forth. Um, again, back to once the fuel, the the the, the level playing fields are uh, or the or the the field have been level, I think the given the choice. There will always be, uh, I think, as far as the, uh, who doesn't want to actually the burn a lower or even maybe zero carbon fuel, right? But it's yeah. it's, it's the currently now it's the is is the economic that doesn't doesn't make it happen. So if you're yeah. if you're asking me whether why do you need a dual fuel, it's basically reality is can we depend totally on ammonia to 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 fuel the vessel with the current development? Perhaps not. So. If you look at the conventional fuel capabilities in the dual fuel ammonia carrier, uh, ammonia dual fuel uh, vessels, it's basically just to supplement the ammonia um, in all fairness, really. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Captain Peter. Uh, so we've uh, got to the end of the, of the end of the hour and um, we don't have too much time left for, for questions. Uh, so what I'd like to do is, is obviously thank all of our speakers uh, who presented case studies today. Uh, and I'd like to, to just mention some of the, the key points that I found really uh, useful in, in today's session. So certainly uh, I, I think from Jacob's presentation on the Green Fuels for Denmark project, we really learned about uh, the, the value of having broad partnerships uh, and certainly in terms of learning uh, different strategies towards uh, pushing zero emissions technologies. And then uh, I guess on the, from the VOPAC presentation from, from Harry and, and Kami, uh, we learned a lot about, uh, I guess, some of the, the requirements there are to get towards ammonia bunkering and certainly around global fuel standards. But, but Harry also mentioned the importance of those, uh, those specific uh, trade routes or, or corridors um, that can be used as, as testing grounds, um, which certainly supports a lot of the work we've been doing around green corridors um, to, to sort of 
use as, as testing grounds. And then uh, Captain, Captain Lou has, has been able to give us a really great presentation on uh, what the uh, trajectory is looking for like for the, for the development of zero emission fuel, uh, zero emission vessels specifically um, on ammonia. So um, with that in mind, I, I'd like to bring the session to a close and say thank you to um, all our presenters. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that this is an ongoing study. Um, what we're doing into zero emission uh, pilot projects and demonstration projects. So as I mentioned at the start, we want to hear what's going on. Uh, so certainly keep us in, in the loop. And we hope that uh, through publicising these trends, uh, people around the world, uh, stakeholders in the shipping industry uh, can see who they can form partnerships with what types of projects uh, are, are going to be feasible and also get some inspiration to, to push towards uh, further, further work in zero emission shipping. So uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Thank you.